Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's installment of our Lunch Bites series. My name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the pleasure of serving as Director of Operations and Scholarship for the United States Capitol Historical Society. We're so grateful that so many of you have taken time out of your busy day to join us uh, and learn a little bit of history over the lunch hour. Uh, before we get started with today's program, I'd like to go over a couple of technical housekeeping matters. Uh, we love using this Zoom webinar platform to engage with you, our audience, uh, while we can't meet in person. Uh, and one of the things we like about this platform is that we can you can submit questions uh, as the program proceeds, uh, which Steve will be able to answer at the end of his presentation. So if you have any questions uh, that you would like addressed during the course of this program, any tech content based questions, you can put those into the Q&A section of the webinar. It looks like two speech bubbles, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on what kind of device you're using to join us today. If you have any technical troubleshooting issues, if you feel like you're having difficulty hearing us or seeing us, uh, you can put that into the chat section of the webinar. I will be keeping an eye on that in real time. So once again, any content questions for Steve can go into the Q&A section. Any technical issues can go into the chat section and I'll answer that off screen. It's now also my great pleasure to introduce the President and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell, to get us started. Jane. Thank you so much, Sam. We really appreciate all the hard work that goes on behind the scenes in order to make these Lunch Bites series happen. We started these uh, out of necessity uh, when the pandemic made gathering together in person not safe. And what we found is by doing these week after week uh, over now a year and a half, that we have developed quite a set of understanding about the capital, the people who made the neighborhood, the building, the process of building it. And it is an ever flowing, it's like peeling an onion. You just keep going and there's just more and more stories. And we are so fortunate to have our very own public historian, Steve Livengood, who provides often uh, stories and information uh, as we try to understand the capital and the people who made this neighborhood uh, something that is unique in all the world, where we actually have a building that is the temple of democracy and a community around it. So today we're going to learn about one of the unsung heroes of the development of Washington, D.C., William Coston. And the interesting thing is on the occasion of his untimely death in 1842, the businessmen of Capitol Hill commissioned a very striking lithograph, a portrait of William Coston, and they tr called it a tribute to worth by his friends. And in the background of the lithograph is the drawing of the Bank of Washington the first and most prominent, prominent bank in the Capitol. And one might wonder, why would you have to call out someone's worth in the commission? Well, apparently, William Coston was Martha, Custis's, Martha Custis Washington's grandson. So why was he not included in the family history? Well, obviously it's because his mother was enslaved. But if that's the case, why does he not appear in the inventories of the Custis family property? And even more mysteriously, how did a tea set in California trigger an acknowledgement of Costin's place in Mount Vernon history? So join us for a fascinating walk through history. Our public historian, Steve Livengood, tell us about the story. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, this is the quotation from the drawing, and this is the drawing itself. Uh, we published it in our book, Creating Capitol Hill, and it was so striking that I decided to do a little bit of uh, looking further in, into it, find out what, who in the world is this guy. He has a very middle class appearance and pose. He's got a bank in the background, and that is the Bank of Washington, which was on New Jersey Avenue Southeast in that, um, uh, in that era. <clears throat> uh, here's a, oh dear. Okay, I, I have a touch screen and it does funny things to me sometimes. Um, nope, that's still not it. Oh, 
Now let's see if it works. There we go, okay. Um, this is a photograph of New Jersey Avenue Southeast and I've marked the orange arrow with where the Bank of Washington was. This is the, the corner of New Jersey and C and this is the location today of the Cannon House office building uh, on the lower end. Uh, <clears throat> the bank was um, located in this uh, place and was the most prominent bank. The founder and the president was Daniel Carroll of Duddington. Uh, the cashier who lived in the bank was Abigail Adams' nephew, Samuel Elliott, who himself did some developing uh, in the capital. Uh, and you can see in the lithograph is the, is the sign of the bank there above the door. Costin was the night porter in the bank. Uh, and it's very unusual for there to be a major tribute when a night porter dies. Uh, so we want to look at what, at what Costin actually did and why he achieved this kind of notoriety. Um, look at the way the man is dressed. Uh, he's, got his, he's got a waistcoat on here. He's got his arm in the, in the waistcoat, which is the one one poses when you have to pose for a long time without moving. Um, he's got glasses on and, and a, uh, a very firm, clear uh, view and a very pretentious hat there. So it is an intriguing uh, thing to have been, had done at his, for his funeral. The artist is Samuel Charles, who was quite well known as a portraitist at that time. And the lithograph is by Charles Fendrich. Uh, it was commissioned for his funeral, uh, which was attended by a lot of local dignitaries, uh, including the U.S. Attorney Francis Scott Key. Um, the funeral was reported in the Baltimore Sun. They said there were more than 200 hacks, that is horse-drawn taxis, and other vehicles in the parade, and uh, many more horses uh, or people on horseback uh, as well. Costin himself had been a hack driver before he became the night porter of the bank. And so all of the hack drivers in Washington knew him and looked up to him. Uh, it was reported in the Daily National Intelligencer, which was sort of the equivalent in that day of the Washington Post, that is one of the most prominent newspapers in the country. Uh, and um, the quotation from his obituary there and the, and the account of the funeral is, quote, possessing the unlimited confidence of the president, directors, and officers of the bank, millions of money were allowed to pass through the hands of the deceased. And in no one instance, we are authorized to say, was there discovered the slightest defalcation. Now, I've never heard of the word defalcation before, so I had to look it up and I discovered it translates as embezzlement. So what they're saying is that, that Costin handled all of this money and everybody trusted him for a long time. But millions of dollars is a lot of money in that era. And so I kind of wondered if this might not be an exaggeration. So I found a source, David Stewart, a historian who has written about Costin, quote, in 1838-39, Costin is listed dozens of times in reports of the U.S. Treasurer as recipient of warrants issued by different agencies of the U.S. government, especially the Navy and the Post Office. Amounts of many thousands of dollars, in one case it was $50,000, and plainly Costin's duties included more than hauling furniture and running errands, as you would expect of a night porter. Apparently, Costin's job included being the night depository, uh, and so uh, he would get the he would get the money and deposit it in the bank. And uh, this report from David Stewart is only one year out of the twenty-four years that William Costin was the porter at the bank. We know that the Bank of Washington handled the payroll for the House of Representatives and the accounts for each of the wards of the city of Washington. So this is the money that he was handling. And he may actually have handled the payroll itself of the House of Representatives for the bank, suggesting that, uh, as, as one of the obituaries said, 
he was an excellent example to be followed and his many virtues imitated. William Coston was considered to be a black person, a son of mixed race mother and a white father and not considered a full citizen. And yet he was respected right here at the center of power in Washington, DC. This is what makes the man so intriguing to me. And so I wanted to find out what we could do, uh, what we could learn more about him. Later on, he is cited by none other than John Quincy Adams, the former president and a member of the House of Representatives who was addressing the House on the subject of a, of a bill that was to deny the right to vote to black citizens in Washington, DC. And John Quincy Adams used Costa as an example as to why African-Americans deserved the vote in the district. Quote, Costa was as much respected as any man in the district and the large con concourse of citizens that attended his remains to the grave, white as well as black, was evidence of the manner in which he was esteemed by the citizens of Washington. Now, why should such a man be excluded from the franchise when you admit the vilest individuals of the white race to exercise it? That is the question raised by the example of William Coston, and that is the worth of William Coston to his friends. He was proof of our national faith in democracy. Well, who were William Coston's friends? Let's start with his neighborhood. This is the Latrobe map from 1814, which we published in Creating Capitol Hill. And um, uh, it is the survey that uh, Benjamin Latrobe did after the fire of 1814 to, to find out how much of the city had to be rebuilt and so forth. Uh, the blue square marked, the square marked with the blue arrow at the top is square 687, which was the prime one facing the Capitol here. And that is the one that retain, was retained entirely by Daniel Carroll of Duddington uh, to construct his hotel and tavern and boarding houses there. So it was the most prominent and he had traded it for all of the lots because the, the proprietors only got half of the lots and he traded his half of, of another lot for this one so he could have the whole thing. And the other lot is marked here with the other blue arrow. And this was uh, retained by the commissioners of the city for the officers of Congress so that they could build houses there. And you can see in the enlargement there, there are a number of houses there and those were all uh, built and owned and lived in by the sergeants at arms, the clerk of the house and the secretary of the Senate and other officers. Uh, Costin went to work for the bank in 1818, but even before that, uh, he either built or bought a brick house on this block, and the records differ whether it was 1807 or 1812. This is a later um, plat of the block, and uh, in case you can't make, make out the notations on it, this is the is the lot that William Coston had built a house on even before he went to work for the bank. Uh, but among the other properties are some owned by the officers of Congress. The officers themselves no longer lived there uh, by the time he was there, but they owned and rented the houses. They were boarding houses for members of Congress and senators. Uh, and it was just two blocks from the bank and right next to the Capitol. This plat shows the building owners that uh, the people who owned the buildings and how distinguished they were. The corner closest to the Capitol, which is the upper left, is owned by Samuel Blodgett, a major investor in Washington. He's the one who built Blodgett's hotel uh, that at the time the British burned the, build, burned the city was the largest private building in the city. It was on 7th Street between D and E Northwest and it housed the post office and the patent office. Another owner is Buckner Thurston. Uh, Thurston was uh, a prominent local judge. Uh, William and Daniel Brent owned one of the properties here. That's a prominent family in Washington. The mayor, uh, first mayor of Washington was Robert Brent, one of their uh, relatives. And that family owned the quarry that the sandstone was obtained from which the sandstone was obtained to build the Capitol and the White House. Now they sold the quarry to the government rather than develop it themselves as a quarry but they had owned it before. Dr. Frederick May is the first uh, practicing doctor in the city of Washington, and he had a contract to treat the workers from the capital construction. And then there's Benjamin Burns, who was a tailor 
and and uh, made clothes for the cap for the uh, uh, congressmen and senators there right next door. So Costin still owned uh, the house at the time of his death. Um, and he lived there longer than he worked at the bank. He left the house to his unmarried daughters. Uh, actually, let me go back here and, and show you the location again. He left the house to his unmarried daughters and the eldest daughter was to be in charge. And in his will, um, the, uh, the daughters lived there afterwards and may have continued their school for African-American children right there next to the Capitol grounds. In Coston's will, he, he said, quote, it shall be descended from heir to heir forever. He is telling his heirs, do not sell this house. This is our patrimony. Uh, we do know that one daughter married and moved away, but the other daughters continued to live there. Now, this, this is what Costin would have seen out his front door. Now, he was off to the left in this photograph, so it would have been uh, looking to the side. But nevertheless, this shows you how close he was to the Capitol building. So the location of, uh, of Costin's house, I can show you here, this is a photograph of the Capitol grounds as, uh, from the mall side. You can see the orange arrow shows you where on the Capitol grounds Costin's house was. So you can see how close he was to the center of power. William Costin was not only respected, he was pretentious. He wanted that respect and he acted accordingly. And that's what to me makes his career so fascinating. He named his children as though they were part of the Custis family. He established a tradition of entail to preserve his estate. That is, under English law before the American Revolution, you could declare your state to, estate to belong to the family and not to any particular individual so that no one had the right to sell it. And that's what Costin is trying to do privately by telling his daughters, do not sell this house. It's to be passed to my heirs for, to heirs forever. Um, now, he also, um, uh, he wanted to present, preserve his, in, his entail by, by uh, uh, making use of the cost and names. He also left, left two brick houses in Northwest Washington, one to each of his sons. And again, his will says that these houses shall descend from heir to heir forever. The, uh, the states all abolished entail in their laws at the time of the revolution, but, but Costin is trying to establish this privately within his family. And this shows the pretentiousness of, of this man. Now I've shown the orange arrows here to show you George Washington houses. These, are, these were two houses that George Washington built on North Capitol Street. And, um, and, so, and you can see they're very prominent on the edge of the hill there, which is why George built them there. And the blue arrow now shows you where William Costin's houses were. That's probably not his house that you can see in the, um, uh, the White House at the arrow, but across the street from George Washington's houses there would have been where William Costin's son's two brick houses. This is an 1841 painting by Christopher Cranch, um, who is also uh, related to Ad Abigail Adams. So uh, William Costin is not putting up uh, pretentious houses so much like George Washington did, but he's uh, locating in the neighborhood and making it up out of brick on wide corner lots so that these houses have value. Costin named all of his children Park Costas, P-A-R-K-E, Park Costin, and uh, just as Martha Washington's descendants were named Park Costas. And the reason is that in compliance with the terms of a will uh, back in uh, Martha Washington's family uh, that specified the inheritance of certain properties in Virginia only by individuals named Park. So everybody that descended had to have the word name Park in their name in order to, to benefit from this uh, property. And uh, so um, William Costin is using this in his children's names so that they can make claim uh, against the property as well. He even used, named his boys Calvert and Custis because uh, uh, Martha Washington's um, 
son married into the Calvert family of Maryland. And, uh, and she, of course, had married into the Custis family of Virginia. So he uses those names in his children's names to make sure that the lineage is understood. He even used the women's names from Martha's family. Martha, he named his daughters Martha, Elizabeth, Anne, and all with the middle name Hark. Now, here's some other, na other neighbors, Thomas Law and El Eliza Custis, who later who married Thomas Law. Uh, and then later divorced him. But this is, the, uh, this is their portraits done by Gilbert Stewart on the occasion of their marriage in 1796. And they are uh, Custis's neighbors and friends as well. I put them uh, here so they're facing away to indicate their divorce, which was the first recorded in Washington, DC. This is the existing Thomas Law House. This building still exists on the waterfront in Washington. The Thomas Law and Eliza lived there only temporarily for a few months while they were waiting for their uh, house to be finished. Uh, but it still exists and is the last of the remaining houses where Thomas Law of the four, I should say the last remaining of the houses where uh, Thomas Law lived during his life. Um, so this again is the New Jersey Avenue property with um, uh, the bank mark, but on the right, I put a blue arrow to show you which was Thomas Law's house. Now, the mansard roof is, was added later, and this is as the house appeared just before it was torn down, uh, but it was at the corner of New Jersey Avenue and C Street where, where uh, uh, the Cannon House office building is now. This was one of the most prominent blocks in Washington. Thomas Law himself was a director of the Bank of Washington, where uh, Coston later worked, uh, a major landowner and developer. He assembled the syndicate that built the old brick capital. That's what I put the picture in here. Thomas Law is the one who arranged for a place for Congress to meet while they were uh, waiting for the capital to be built, rebuilt after the British burned it. Uh, and, and, uh, and then the Congress bought it and, and used it uh, as an annex for a long time after that. Uh, he, Thomas Law, financed the Washington City Canal System and, in fact, lost his fortune that way. Uh, he teamed with Daniel Carroll of Duddington to, to build the bridge to Alexandria, which was known as the Long Bridge, because at the time it was the longest bridge in the United States. And uh, he, and they also, it's now known, of course, as the 14th Street Bridge. Uh, but he also uh, arranged the building of the first Benning Road Bridge. Uh, there's still a bridge at Benning Road. Uh, Thomas Law teamed with James Greenleaf, Robert Morris, and John Nicholson, but luckily did not join their syndicate uh, because the other three ended up in debtor's prison and Thomas Law did not. Uh, but Greenleaf is the one who had recruited Thomas Law in New York City to come and help build the city of Washington as a capital for popular government. Thomas Law was the son and brother of English bishops and made his fortune in India in, by introducing the Mar Maharaja where he was stationed to British business practices and made them both rich. Um, but in Indian law, sorry, I'm not done with Thomas Law here. Uh, British law forbade Thomas Law to marry to a native of India. And uh, he nevertheless had three sons with a lady there and brought them with him when he came back to uh, uh, this part of the world. Two of those sons came with him to DC and lived here uh, after they graduated from Yale and Harvard, respectively. At age 40, Thomas Law met the granddaughter of Martha Washington, who was 20 and ready for marriage, and he proposed to her. Uh, George and Martha Washington objected to that, but the, eventually they consented, and it is to, to Eliza Custis Law that, that George Washington wrote his famous letter on love and marriage. So this is Eliza Custis Law. She's also associated with, with uh, William Coston. She was the daughter of Martha Washington's son, Jackie, uh, who died in, of typhoid in the army at Yorktown. She was the eldest child. And here she is married to this rich and glamorous man, but he left for months at a time, went to England and to, to New York to take care of his other properties and see his, his uh, uh, investments. And he left her alone here in Washington. This was not the kind of life that she planned and she had to continue to stay with her relatives as though she weren't married because it wasn't considered safe for a, for a, uh, a young woman to live by herself for months and years at a time. 
Uh, and there were rumors, sure enough, of her having a relationship with a, with a young soldier. So they had the first divorce recorded in, in the city of Washington, but they waited till after Martha uh, Washington died to do that. Uh, Eliza Custis had received a gift from uh, Martha Washington at the time of the wedding, which is very significant. Uh, the, it was intended that Martha, that give her personal maid, only judge who was enslaved as a gift to uh, Eliza Custis to pass along this part of her inheritance. But Martha had taken Oni to Philadelphia and Oni found out that she was going to be given to Eliza and she told some people, she's quoted as saying that she would never work for Eliza Custis. Uh, Eliza had a reputation of being difficult with slaves as well as with anyone else. Uh, and Philadelphia was a center of abolitionists under Pennsylvania law, all slaves were freed if after they spent six months in Pennsylvania. And so Oni Judge was sent back to DC before her six months were up. Uh, however, she had contacts among the Philadelphia free black community that helped her escape. And she lived the rest of her life in New Hampshire. George Washington made regular attempts to recover Martha's property, that is her, her dower slave, uh, Oni Judge, uh, because it was his responsibility to make sure that they stayed in the family. But she was a, sa a successful escapee and never did return to slavery. Instead, Martha Washington had to give uh, to Eliza for her gift, the younger sister of Tony Judge, whose name was Philadelphia, uh, nicknamed Delphi Judge. And around the same time that she uh, became the property under the law of Eliza Custis, she married William Coston. So this is Coston's wife and she is enslaved to Martha Washington's granddaughter. And they, they lived, it's likely that they at least uh, spent some time in that Thomas Law House that still exists uh, while William and, and uh, while Thomas and Eliza lived there. But certainly Coston and wife were in the New Jersey house uh, before he went to work for the bank. Eliza Custis Law never again remarried and lived on her own estate near Alexandria, which today is the site of the Virginia Theological Seminary uh, and Episcopal High School. Another neighbor is Daniel Carroll of Duddington II. This is the only image we have of him from life. It was a profile, obviously, but he's the man who donated the site of the capital uh, to the nation. He was the largest landowner in the original city of Washington, the founder and president of the Bank of Washington where Custis, where Coston worked. Uh, and he owned the land where Coston's sons had their houses. So the Coston paid an annual land rent to Carroll for those houses. Um, and he's the primary development the developer there on Capitol Hill, along with Thomas Law. Now, it is significant to know that uh, in a time when most enslaved people could not read or write, and it was against the law to teach them, and they signed with an X and witnesses, one historian commented on the fact that William Coston had beautiful handwriting. He was not only literate, but he was elegant, and he kept, keep the records at the bank. So he's far more than just a night porter. In 1818, uh, Coston helped establish a school for Af African-American children. His daughter, Louisa Park Coston, led, a, led the school until her death in 1831. In 1835, the famous white rioters that burned all the black schools in Washington, D.C., uh, in what we know as the snowstorm in August, um, the first big race riot in Washington. They burned all the schools for black children except Costas. We don't know why. It could have been because it was next to the Capitol, but it could also have been because of their respect for Billy Coston and his family, that they did not burn that school. Coston helped found the Resolute Benef Benef Beneficial Society, which was a burial insurance company for African-Americans. And he was president of the company in 1818, the same time he went to work for the bank. Uh, in 1821, his church on Capitol Hill voted to segregate the, their black members and make them all sit in the balcony. 
So Costin helped form the Israel Colored Methodist Episcopal Church in a separate building uh, and with an African-American minister. He helped found the Columbian Harmony Society, and, uh, which was a cemetery for black residents and the Black Masonic Lodge uh, in Washington. Most significant is that William Costin filed a lawsuit uh, in court to overturn the $20 bond and three character references that the DC government was requiring as refer uh, for free blacks to stay in Washington, DC. Now he won his own case. He did not have to pay the $5 fine for not registering. And the judge said that the new DC law did not apply to those living in DC when it was passed but the law was affirmed for those arriving after passage. Later on, Costin purchased the freedom of seven of his own relatives and maintained friendship and business relationships with all four of Martha Washington's grandchildren. Uh, he engaged in West Indies trading and traded Capitol Hill projects, uh, properties. So we know that he was involved in business extensively far beyond the bank uh, where he worked. Now, we've now established William Costin's worth. Uh, the tribute to his friends has called us to pay attention to him. But where did he come from and how did he get there? These are the next questions, of course. And it gets down to a tea set. Now, this is not the tea set in question, but this is one of them from Mount Vernon and, uh, and an example of the kind of thing we're talking about. In 1981, uh, Mount Vernon received a letter about a tea set that the family uh, believed had been inherited from uh, through, by William Custis Costin from Martha Washington and it had been used at Mount Vernon. Uh, and the, the letter had come from Marcia Cust Costin Carter, Marcia Costin Co Carter, who was a descendant of William Costin. And she called him William Custis Costin. This seems to be the first reference to him with the name uh, Custis actually attached to, to his name. Mount Vernon had no record of William Costin or of Anne Dandridge, who is uh, by the uh, family was his mother. There are records of births in family Bibles uh, and inventories of enslaved people at each farm at Mount Vernon, but no record of these two people. But Mount Vernon decided to ask for more information. And they received uh, a letter back from Marcia Custis, Costin Carter, sorry, Marcia Costin Carter. Uh, and she sent a, a handwritten family tree plus a citation from a book. They said that William Costin, known as Billy, was born on Mount Vernon Plantation to Ann Dandridge and she later married an enslaved man named Costin. That Billy's father came from the Custis family and that he was born free. In citing, uh, in, in citing this information, she cited a book called The History of the Negro Race in America from 1619 to 1880 by George W. Williams. And the information about Costin in there was based on the 1871 congressional report about uh, teachers uh, in the DC public schools, one of whom was um, Harriet Costin, daughter of William Costin. This is the first indication to Mount Vernon that the Costins were black. That information was not part of the letter about the tea set. Uh, and is the first Mount Vernon historical notice of Ann Dandridge, the mother of uh, William Costin and William Costin himself. In the history of the Negro race, George Williams wrote that William Costin's father was, quote, from a prominent family in Virginia, end quote. Uh, the handwritten family tree ad identified the father as Custis, but gave no first name. Now, Mount Vernon was able to find some another reference, and this was in the Virginia land, uh, Historical Society in the Virginia Van Lu papers. Virginia Van Lu was the Richmond postmaster mistress in the 1860s and one of those prominent African Americans in Virginia. And she had records of Harriet Costin 
as the daughter of William Costin. And in her records, Jackie Custis, Martha Washington's son, is named as Harriet's grandfather and therefore the father of William Costin. Now, both uh, William and Anne show up familiarly in family correspondence, just not in the official records in the Bibles and the inventories. So from George Washington Park Custis, who was Martha's grandson and Jackie's son, uh, there, he, there are two checks, of, um, bank checks written by George Washington Park Custis to Billy Costin, showing that he was hiring Billy for things. One of the checks is at Tudor Place in Georgetown. It's, a, it's framed up on the wall. And the other is amongst the family papers at Mount Vernon. Eliza Custis, Mary Thomas Law. This is a portrait of her as a child. This is Martha Washington's eldest granddaughter and Jackie's eldest child. She is the slave owner from Billy, uh, Billy Costin's wife, Delphi Judge. But in a letter, we know that she borrowed money from Billy Costin. It was only $20, but that was a lot more money than it is today. And it is significant that she would have borrowed that money um, from him. And she's, she's acknowledging it and asking a, a relative to, to help her repay it. In a later collection of correspondence given to Mount Vernon, uh, <clears throat> we run across the third child, Martha Washington's youngest granddaughter, Nellie. And uh, Nellie is Jackie Custis's youngest daughter and Martha Washington's youngest granddaughter. And we have an 1813 letter from her asking Billy Costin to drive her to Philadelphia. This is while he's still a hack driver and to bring his mother along. And then an 1816 letter asking him to drive her children's tutor to Baltimore and care for him during the journey because he was ill. So these are the kind of ties that we can document uh, between uh, William Costin and, and uh, his purported relatives uh, in Martha Washington's family. <clears throat> and the letters refer to the trust and familiarity that they had with Billy Costin. Now, Mary Thompson is the expert at Mount Vernon on the slavery at Mount Vernon. This is the, cop, the uh, cover of her book, The Only Unavoidable Sub Subject of Regret, which is a definitive work about George Washington and slavery at Mount Vernon. Um, and she points out that there's one problem with the story of the Costin family as they tell it, and that is that Aunt Anne Dandridge is listed as a childhood playmate of Martha Washington uh, and as a daughter of John Dandridge Mar and therefore Martha's half sister. Well, Martha Custis was born in 1731 and William Costin was not, and his siblings were born between 1780 and 1801. So that if Anne Dandridge is the mother of William Costin, she would have to have been born between 1750 and 1765 and definitely would not have been Martha Washington's childhood playmate. But Mary Thompson believes that there, there are actually two women in this story, uh, probably a mother and daughter and possibly both named Anne, which would explain the, the confusion. And in fact, in all those families, they were always naming the kids the same thing as their parents. And so it's a continuing problem, not just in the, in the Dandridge family, but uh, she, she, Mary Thompson suggests that there was an, an Anne Dandridge born in seven, between 1726 and 1736, which would make her the right age to be a play, playmate of Martha Washington, and that she could very well have been the daughter of John Dandridge. And that there probably was a daughter, she had a daughter uh, also named Dan, who would, Dan, I'm sorry, also named Anne, who was born between 1750 and 1765 and would have gone to Mount Vernon with Martha and been the mother of William Costin and his siblings at the age somewhere between 15 and 51. So this would explain the, the, uh, this discrepancy in the oral history from the Costin family. Now, we get to the question of whether, in fact, William Costin was a grandson of Martha Washington. And was Jackie Custis the father of William Costin? 
Jackie Custis was the, was the only male Custis at Mount Vernon between 1779 and 1780. George Washington was away with the army and Martha was with George in the winter. And uh, where was Jackie Custis? Well, he, we know he died in 1781 at the age of 26. At the, in 1773, at the age of 18, he had married Eleanor Calvert, who was the age of 15. And over the next seven years, she was pregnant six times. Uh, they had one set of twins and four of the children lived out of seven, the four that I have named off here. Uh, and during this time, Eleanor was always bedridden and Martha stayed with her. Her pregnancies were difficult and Jackie was often at Mount Vernon between 1779 and 1780. Jackie's personality was such that George Washington would exasperate exasperated by Jackie's impulsive behavior. And so I think we can come to the conclusion that Jackie Custis is quite likely William Costas, Costin's father uh, because his poor wife was busy being pregnant uh, through that whole period. Now we get to the question, was William Costin born free? Part of the problem is that there are no records uh, of his existence at Mount Vernon, but why? The truth is that mixed race children were often out, were usually outside the marriages and they were fairly common in the United States. Mixed race children with white fathers were often free. In fact, John Custis IV, Martha Washington's father-in-law, uh, and Jackie's grandfather sat on the Royal Council of Virginia and in their records is the time when he, he got his buddies on the council to declare his mixed race son as free. So that existed in the, in the Custis family. We know that it also existed in the Dandridge family. Uh, record, records were kept only of the heirs in Bibles and christenings uh, and of in and of the enslaved property and tax rolls and estates and business deals, but no records were kept of the free mixed race individuals. The writer Henry Winsack, who wrote The Imperfect God about George Washington and his slaves based on the records at uh, Mount Vernon, uh, finds a record showing that, that there was a man referred to as Negro Will who was manumitted by Thomas Law in 1801. Now we know that Thomas Law had uh, uh, the, the uh, control of the dower slaves that belonged to his wife, uh, uh, Eliza Custis Law. And uh, here we have him freeing some of them. And uh, there's one named Will, and there's no record of a Washington or Custis slave named Will or Billy who was of the right age. So why would Thomas Law free um, William Costin, if Costin was not enslaved. <clears throat> there is also um, a, a Negro, Nancy, who is freed at the same time. And Nancy was in that era a common nickname for Anne, and we know that Anne Dandridge was referred to um, by that name at times. Law retained the dower slaves, and in 1807, he freed Costin's siblings, his wife, and his children. And no other enslaved uh, individuals had the right name and age through that period. So Henry Wiencheck uh, thinks that Tom, Thomas Law manumitted Costin and his mother to give them legal status after Martha Washington's death. They were freed, but they had no proof of their freedom because there were no records of their, their existence. And there were um, slave catchers uh, all over the place at work in that era. And William Costin would have had no uh, written record of being free. So the Tom Thomas Law had a motive for freeing William Costin or manumitting him to give him the papers that he would need uh, since Martha Washington was the witness and she was dead. So, um, <clears throat> So the, the Costin family history says that William Costin was born at Mount Vernon Plantation around 18, around 1780, that seems to be documented. Uh, that seems to 
fit with the records that his mother was Anne Dandridge and, and she later married a, an enslaved man named Coston. Um, and uh, that his father was in the Custis family and that he was born free. So all of this seems to be confirmed by the historic records. So now um, I'm gonna show you a few images that would relate, help you understand um, and get a little perspective of, on William Coston's life. Here you have some carriages in front of the Capitol building. This would be after um, 1850 because uh, there's the full dome on the Capitol after 1855 actually, but uh, the carriages would be the same sort of thing that William Coston had driven. And here's another photograph taken from uh, the top of the Capitol showing some carriages in front and you can see the entrance to the House of Representatives uh, uh, extension there on the right. This is an image from 1882 uh, of what probably uh, the cabins looked like that Thomas Law built for African Americans um, on Capitol Hill. And, and it's noted in, in 1882 that this uh, building was still within sight of the Capitol. And this would have been near the, the, son, the homes of William Coston's sons, but their houses were built, built out of brick. But this would have been right there in the neighborhood with them. Um, <clears throat> This is a famous drawing of a slave coffle passing the Capitol. This is a group of Africans in, enslaved and, and being taken off to be sold and marched through the city. Generally, this had to happen at night, uh, which may explain why the drawing is so dark. But William Coston would have in, encountered this kind of thing all of his life. And he would have been very conscious the whole time of the way his life uh, sat on the edge of this fate. He could have been taken into slavery any time and had very little recourse. And his son, Coston's son's houses stood uh, just behind the poplars on the left side of this drawing. Uh, so this would have been right close to his house. So we wind up and I have uh, cited several books in the course of, of, uh, of this uh, talk. But I also wanted to note that I have certain personal sources uh, for this talk. Now, do we have any questions uh, or comments? In sum, I want to explain that uh, Coston was a respected and ambitious and pretentious man. And that is part of what makes him so intriguing to me. This kind of person built our country despite the difficulty and the obscurity in history. And when we can find and recover of them, of them I think it's fascinating. This is my tribute today to, to the worth of William Coston, and I consider myself a friend of his. So thank you. Jane, did we get any comments? We, we actually have several questions, Steve. Um, and I think one of the most fascinating things that from all that you said is that because William Coston was a mixed race person who was the result of uh, sexual relations between enslaved, an enslaved person and a non-enslaved person, that those persons, while they were many, ended up in this never, never land. While they had been freed, they, because they never existed in the roles, as you went through the history, there was no record of their freedom. Now, a couple, I'm gonna put these questions together. Um, and that is, what sort of relationship does William Coston have with uh, GWP Custis, who was the owner of Arlington uh, until he died in 1857 and the father-in-law of Confederate General Lee? Do you know? Well, Was yes, as I, he, he, I'm sorry if you missed the reference in the, in the talk. Uh, um, he would actually be William Coston's half brother. And, uh, and we know that he hired Coston. We have these two checks that he wrote him for that uh, George Washington Park Custis wrote to Coston for things that, that uh, Coston had done for him. Uh, and so, uh, and, and he's got relations and is doing things for, for Custis's sisters as well. So the evidence is that there was a very warm and familial kind of relationship between those four Custis children and William Coston. Got it. 
And where is he buried? Is there a family plot that he is part of? Um, I failed to write that down. I believe it's in one of the references, but of course he was on the board of a, of a cemetery. And, uh, and unfortunately I didn't write that one down, but I think, I think we do know where he's buried, but I will. Um, okay. Um, but his family moved to California, of course. Got it. And then we have, um, one of the questions um, is from someone who's obviously uh, following closely the activities of William Coston, who was the third worshipful master of so Social Lodge Number One, um, and have you done any research with his sons and their activism in D.C.? Um, uh, Mr. Morgan, who's one of our listeners, uh, has images of them uh, because he's the historian of D.C.'s Prince Hall Grand Lodge. I would love to have that. Um, uh, in the, I didn't use very many sources here and, and I'm not aware of anything that's been published uh, about that. And so I would be very interested in anything and we'll, we'll add, I'm gonna be giving this talk again, in fact, to the, to the uh, Henry Clay chapter, the Daughters of the American Revolution uh, shortly. And so if, if I can include any of that, I would really like that. I've also given one talk already to the Prince Hall Mason, since I was not connect, uh, not aware of the of the connection with the Costins there, and so I would very much be interested in whatever Mr. Morgan has um, would care to share with me about that. I will try to add that to my to my talk when I give this in the future. Great, and we have Cassandra Good is writing a biography of the Costas grandchildren, um, and she's interested in including the materials that you've talked. And her question is. What do you make of the fact that there was nothing in writing about his lifetime um, or soon after that suggested that Jackie Custis was his father? Um, well, the, the suggestion came fairly quickly because Virginia Van Loo uh, was uh, operating in the 1860s. And so in fact, she's the one that says that Jackie was the father. Now, um, most likely this is all oral history, which is the, the way things get passed down. Uh, and uh, and there's, uh, what I make of it is that there's a whole lot of information there about a lot of people who have been lost to history and how, how great it is that we've been able to at least recover this much about William Coston. But that is the fate of most people, uh, is that, they get, that uh, their paperwork gets lost and we can only consider so many people as we study history and, and uh, what a shame that we, that we don't do a better job. Uh, I have mixed feelings about the amount of information that is being collected about me and that might be available to history in the future, historians in the future through the um, social media companies and so forth. Uh, and so uh, uh, we may reach a limit on that, uh, but it is, uh, the fact is we're not getting we're not getting paper records of people anymore. And so there's, there's gonna be a problem in the future about recovering people in the same way. And um, anyway, uh, that's what I make of it. Well, and Mr. Morgan tuned in uh, to alert us that uh, uh, he's buried in Harmony Cemetery and his grave was desecrated in the 1960s uh, along with 37,000 other African-American graves. Uh, so there's, more to story in there. Um, yes, I will add that to the to the um, uh, to the talk for the next time I give it. And question: uh, You mentioned that Elizabeth Park Custis had a home where Episcopal High School and Virginia Theological Seminary is now located. Uh, does any of that original structure still remain, or is it just been torn? Was it torn down? Yes, my understanding is that the house there on Quaker Lane, I believe it's Quaker, yeah, Quaker Lane, uh, it's connected with the Episcopal High School or, or the seminary, one or the other, is Eliza Custis's house. Oh, interesting. And, and it's interesting how little of that property has been sold off. It's all Episcopalians of one sort or another. Well, there you go. Yeah, and um, there it is at the, at the center of Alexandria, which is a booming area, but they've managed to maintain that. Hold uh, on. 
Yeah. Now, when did the family leave for California? When did they leave Washington for California? That I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I didn't find any record of that. Okay. Um, and what about uh, Costin's wife, Delphi Judge? Do you know how long she she lived and was she ever freed? She was freed, yes. Uh, Thomas Law freed her in 1807 along with their children. But um, uh, I don't, beyond that, I do not know. Well, this is an incredible tribute um, and really a great tribute to your work. Um, and Mr. Morgan says some of the family stayed in DC through the early 1900s, but he lost track of them in the 1930s. Um, so that's the, that's the word from Mr. Morgan, who's clearly a Costas historian. You two have got to get together. Um, yes, Mr. Morgan, thank you very much. I'm honored that you attended. Uh, and so we will also encourage um, people to continue to watch because Cassandra Good uh, appears to be working on this book on the grandchildren. So when, when that comes out, Miss Good, let us know. We, we would love to have you on and have you talk about your book as, as we move forward. We come to the end of our hour. Uh, Steve, you always amaze us with your depth of knowledge and your understanding. Now, what's your favorite part of this story? If you could just pick one piece, what would be your very favorite part? It, it would be that drawing, that portrait of him, because this says so much in this man that, uh, that, he, that he had a he had a sense of self that I can't imagine anyone would have, would have developed if he had been in, born enslaved. It would have been very difficult for somebody to have that much self-confidence that he would build a house practically on the Capitol grounds, that he would start a school when the city would not educate his children and the other African-American children. He's leading his community um, and not running away and hiding from the dangers that, that existed at the time. He is just one of the most remarkable people for his, his sense of self and his sense of presence. And is the kind of, that's the kind of person that builds civilizations. Well, excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, we look forward, um, you know, as always, we thank you very much for your participation, for your engagement. We thank you, Steve, for your words of wisdom. And for all of our listeners, we are so grateful for you. Um, as you know, the society lives on the donations and the support of members and guests and friends. And so thank you for that. Uh, we have coming up events uh, in honor of the 101st uh, anniversary of women earning the right to vote. We are gonna have a conversation with a pioneering woman political figure, Connie Morella. Uh, and Ambassador Morella was an ambassador. She was a member of Congress. She was a local elected official. And she is just full of stories. And so I hope you'll tune in for a conversation with uh, Ambassador Connie Morella about her journey uh, as a political figure among other things, she raised nine children while serving in public office, which I think is an incredible feat. Um, when we turn to September, uh, we are going to be looking at the life of Frederick Law Olmsted um, and the work that he did on the Capitol grounds as we begin to look forward to the 200th anniversary of his birth. So we will invite you to put that on your calendar right after Labor Day. Um, and we will have yet uh, another focus on 100 years of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier um, on 921. As you get closer to Veterans Day, we want to encourage people around the country to think about how they in their own communities 
can acknowledge the 100 year anniversary of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and think about the sacrifices that are made uh, by people who serve in the military and the families of people who serve in the military who love them so much. So we're grateful for all of your ideas, your support. Uh, please share this activity uh, with your friends and neighbors. Stay cool, stay, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. Be well. Goodbye.